Let's start. Let's call the meeting to order. City Clerk. Council Member Agency Director Mann. Present. Marcus. Here. Cilio. Here. Vice Mayor, Vice Chairman Smith. Here. Mayor, Chairman Paris. Here. We have a quorum. Thank you. Uh, and the invocation is going to be by Pastor Carlos Navarrete from Lancaster Baptist Church. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, and uh, we acknowledge today that you are a creator. And because of that, we thank you for life and the opportunity to be here in breath. And uh, Lord, we acknowledge today, first of all, your sovereignty as creator, and we pray that as this meeting take place, because of that, that we might uh, glorify you. And I pray in a very special way that you would help us today, no matter what is done here, that we might glorify you with all said. And in a special way, help us to uh, attack our problems and, uh, Lord, make this city a better place as a result of, of this time and not to attack one another. And then, Lord, we acknowledge today uh, not just uh, your sovereignty, but the fact that you have established government. And because of that, we pray for, Lord, these uh, men and, and this lady before us and, and this staff. And we pray, first of all, that you would give them wisdom as they seek to make this city a better place. We thank you for them. We pray for their families. Or their endeavors. We pray that you might further their vision to make this a more, more wonderful place for all of the citizens. And then, Lord, we acknowledge your word today, and because of that, we pray that you might help us today to follow principles uh, that would be blessed of you. And we know that only those biblical principles, Lord, are blessed of you. And I pray in a special way because of that, that in Lancaster this year, there, there might be a great, great uh, deal of people who would return to you, Lord, uh, to the principles you've established in your word. We pray, Lord, for revival, that people would repent of sin and, and Lord, trust Jesus Christ, and that because of that, uh, Lord, there might be true reform and peace in the hearts of people. Lord, we now turn this meeting over to you, and we put it in your hands, and I pray that uh, as uh, all these issues are covered, Lord, that you might bless, and I pray that uh, Lancaster would continue to be a city with a heritage of, of peace and of progress. We ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Mr. Silly, you want to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, let's have a seat. And is Ryan Butts here? We ought to make you Athlete of the Year. <laughs> This is Ryan Butts. Ryan's from Antelope Valley High School. Now listen to this. He has recorded the longest jump in the nation during the 2008 high school season with a jump of 24 feet, 10 and a half inches. That's one inch longer than Jesse Owens did in his high school career. Uh, his jump of 24 feet, four and three quarter inches. You get it right down to the quarter inch. Huh? <laughs> won the CIF Division II Championship, breaking the record, which stood for 28 years. He is the 2008 Golden Lake Championship in the long jump, 200-meter dash, and the 4-100 relay. He's the, his honors include the Antelope Valley High School Track and Field Most Valuable Player. I can understand that. Antelope Valley Press Field Athlete of the Year, AB Press Hometown Hero Recipient, and Rise Magazine Jumps Athlete to watch the Los Angeles in the Los Angeles area. He won the 2008 Las Vegas Track Classic Outstanding Male Field Athlete and completed the USA Track and Field Junior Nationals in Columbus, Ohio. Wow. On behalf of the City of Lancaster, we're giving you the Athlete of the Month Award, and this is incredibly impressive. I, I am just, just astonished. This is... Thank you very much.
You know, we are going to have to have an athlete of the year now. <laughs> Everybody read the Valley Press where we have more uh, Olympic medals than most, than not most, but a lot of countries. I thought that was really cool. Okay, moving on. City Manager, do we have any items to be removed? No, sir. Councilor, are there any items on the agency consent calendar you'd like to pull? Okay, do we have a motion? Uh, Mr. Mayor, I'll move that we uh, adopt the... Uh a redevelopment agency consent calendar. Second. I'll second that. So. It's unanimous. Anything on the uh, consent calendar you'd like to pull for discussion? I move that we adopt the consent calendar. Is there a second? I'll second that. Let's vote. Unanimous. Okay, now we're on the council agenda, and it's council item one. We have the Lancaster Lancaster Criminal Justice Commission. How many members do we have here tonight? Okay, we have Marvin Christ, and we have David Vieira, and uh, we discussed this last week, and we had the. Press conference, everybody's familiar with what we're doing. And so, is there a motion? So moved. Excuse me, so moved. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. I, yeah. Uh, let's, let's put the names out there. It's Greg Augusta, Mark Brown, Marvin Christ, Dennis Greer, Chris Johnson, and David Vieira. Uh, Brenda Cash uh, has withdrawn, and we're working with the prison now on who they want to have represented on the uh, Criminal Justice Commission, and we should have that name in two weeks. So as to Greg Augusta, Mark Brown, Marvin Christ, Dennis Greer, Chris Johnson, and David Vieira, do I have a motion? Motion is as stated. Second. Good. Wait a minute, do I have to have any discussion? Good. Okay, it's unanimous. You got one year to make it safer than Santa Clarita. Okay, and we have Diana Cook. Diana, I see you here. Uh, and do we have an motion to appoint her to the Architectural and Design Planning Commission? So moved. Second. Okay, let's vote. It's unanimous. And now we have the Violence Free Zone Report and Update. We have one speaker. I guess we have two. Mr. Mayor, Mr. Vice Mayor, Honorable City Council, thank you for the opportunity to be here. I will not use your time tonight. We have uh, at least three speakers who would like to share just briefly with you to uh, make our request known. I'd like to say to you, I recognize the fact that the catch you're in, and I recognize also without even going any further that the city and city council is not directly responsible for all that needs to happen in the school. But indirectly and as a partner, I would hope that you would consider that with everything you have. I, I don't know who's speaking first. Is that who's speaking first? Okay. One of the principal. Thank you so much. Good evening. Actually, Council, I'm, I'm here just in case you have any questions. I believe uh, you, you received a report, and I know the last time that we were here you had asked to see some data regarding uh, some schools, and I'm here if you have any questions regarding that. Uh, I think what we uh, provided was in, in a multiple formats of a kind of a comparison uh, between Lancaster, Alabama Valley High School, and Eastside High School between first and second semester and a decline or increase of certain areas of uh, discipline that the, um, uh, that the youth advisors were uh, uh, kind of uh, contracted out to be addressing. And if you have any questions regarding that, I'd be happy to answer any of those. Okay. I, I'm pretty satisfied with the report Diana did. I, I, I thought it was excellent. I thought it, it uh, covered all of the areas. The, uh, there, there's some concerns we all have, but I think I'll wait until after the, the, the speakers. Okay. Finish, okay. Hmm? Unless anybody has any questions. Okay. Thank you.
Thank you, Council. My name is Eric Rieger. I'm principal of Eastside High School. I want to thank you for taking time. Again, we've busy schedules to consider this again as a viable program uh, for the city. Um, again, as, as somebody who's been in administration for 10 years and an educator for 20, um, this is uh, one of the best programs I've come in, in contact with. It, it, uh, unlike other programs we see come through our schools, uh, this one directly affects kids. It's something that you can see a difference is in with the uh, lives of the kids and, and the uh, family members of those kids. So. Uh, again, thank you for considering this, and uh, thank you for your investment last year and, and this year as well. Thank you. Uh, again, as Eric stated, we're, we're grateful for the opportunity to come back before you. I'm, I'm going to be very short. Um, I'm 27 years. I've had a boys' home. I've worked in youth program since the Watts Revolt in 1965. This is all I've ever done. <clears throat> One of the things that is most obvious to me is I've seen what is going on in municipalities all across the country. Some very wise, far-sighted individuals from both Lancaster and Palmdale had the wisdom and the courage to try to head off something before they saw their own community absorbed and eventually deteriorated as a result of a climate that is happening throughout the entire country. That climate is predicated on certain incidents, and those incidents are primarily the result of young men and young women going into the, the, uh, the world of, 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 uh, of, 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 of life, going into life without the direction or the guidance that is going to be required for them to become productive citizens in our community. What we have seen is a culture spring up and, and spawned by the lack of fathers and guidance. What does this have to do with the violence-free zone? The closest we can get to providing the type of leadership, direction, and moral responsibility that these young men and young women have absent in their particular lives the closest we can get is what we've been able to em em uh, uh, emulate and imitate and, and do what we've seen done on the East Coast through Bob Woodson's violence free zone program that is operating in schools that are far more at risk than the ones that we have here. After going there with the net with a whole group of people from the Anlo Valley, we all came away knowing that we have a treasure here in Palmdale and Lancaster. And it's a treasure that some people are wise enough to realize we can keep, we can foster, and we can make even better. If we don't make a move like this, then we are basically saying that war on crimes must take a military a military approach. I think it's almost an oxymoron to have a paramilitary force on a campus, and we don't want to go in that direction. We want to protect our youth, but we have a responsibility to give them the information and the knowledge so that proper choices are made, and they don't become a threat to one another, and more importantly, the idea of learning. And that's the whole plan. Take 10% of kids that keep that 90% from learning and alter and change the climate on all the campuses. And basically, in a short period of time, we proved we could do that with a lot of love, a lot of experience from youngsters, young men and young women who've gone through it and now know how to go off in, and, and can step outside the campus into the homes, into the families, and, and deal with the siblings as well as those that are on campus. And we've seen what happens. The, the, both communities have to be commended. If we don't go a step further, if the program fizzles out in six months at Pete Knight and never is, is regenerated in this community, we still must be commended for starting it. But we would be much wiser to keep it going, and we would be the epitome, and we would be the model for the rest of the country to look at. I know I've not seen anything as remarkable as what we've seen take place. And this is with young men and young women who have already given up on this thing called education. Give us an opportunity to do this again, and especially at Eastside because it's bursting. It's, it's cultures, it's gangs from all over that are coming to this wonderful Emerald Valley. We can head off something before it becomes so detrimental that we find ourselves again, not the greatest population in the world, but this huge prison industry that we're growing 
starts off in middle school and in, and in high school. We can change that. We really have shown we can change that. I'm not going to, I said I wouldn't be back to ever ask for money again. Don't need to. You'll make a decision one way or another, and I don't wish nothing bad. I love this community. I've seen something here I've never seen in my life. People that genuinely care about what's going to happen to our children, and we're bold enough to make a move. And that's all I want to say about it. Thanks. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, we have uh, several members of the district here, and I've asked Mr. Jim Lott, who is the chairman of the board at this time, to have a few words with you just to let you know where they are. Can okay. we do that? Good. Thank you. Mr. Lott. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor, Vice Mayor, Council Members. As, as president of the uh, Animal Valley Union High School District Board, uh, we truly accept resources that will help us make our campuses safe. When this program first started, I had some personal concerns about who's going to be responsible for what staff concerned about boundaries. There's a lot of concerns. And that's some concerns about the results. The district as a whole, all the board members, support the violence free zone. However, with the state budget being as it is, and we have had to cut over six million dollars and prioritize where we where they would go without laying off teachers or any of our staff members, we do not have the extra money at this time, as we did last year. And we are looking at the possibility of, of deficit spending. <laughs> so we, that does not say that we do not want or like the balance free zone program. At this time, we can't afford it, but we support it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lott. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Council. Okay, Darlene Cruz. Hello, my name is Darlene Cruz. I'm a student attending Eastside High School. I've been in the Violence Free Zone program for months now, and I met my mentor Priya and along with the Violence Free Zone in the beginning of January. Before I started attending January high school, Eastside High in January, I was recently going to Lancaster High, and I had just got suspended for possession of marijuana. I had gotten into a fight, and I was ditching school. But when I started attending Eastside High School in January of, last, of this year, I met my mentor and she's taught me a lot, you know, she's taught me how to be strong again, she's taught me self-control. She told me once that many obstacles are going to come my way and for me to never give in, and I haven't since then. Um, and now as a sophomore I'm taking AP European History and I don't think I would have been able to do none of this without them. And you know, the mentors that actually care about us, and to a lot of us that means a lot. And they not only helped me, but they helped others in it as well. And that's all I have to say, and, you know, just don't take the program away, and it means a lot. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Nicole Owen. Hi, my name is Nicole Owen. I would like to give you guys um, a little background information from when the Violence Free Zone first came to Eastside. The first time they introduced themselves to Eastside, I thought they were just like another club entering the Eastside, you know. They told the students they were here to make the school better, but I thought to myself, that's never going to happen. But like very soon after, I came to realize they were telling the truth. The amount of fights, tardies, bad behavior, they all went down to like a minimum. They helped me, as well as others, see a different way of living. 
They help you realize the consequences of your actions in and out of school. I truly believe they are a good thing. And for some of us, we wouldn't be where we are today if it wasn't for them. And if they didn't come in our lives, I think we'd all like be worse off. And I think they're, they made a huge impact on East Side. And we're very lucky to have them as a caring, helpful group. And it'd be an honor to keep them here at, us, at our school. Thank you. Thank you. Is it Sorrel Palmer? Did I pronounce that right? Sarah Palmer? I'm sorry. It's Sarah. Okay, I just... Sorry. I'm Sarah. Um, <laughs> I'm a junior at Eastside High School. Um, I met my mentor Priya in about March or sometime around then. Um, before the Violence Free Zone, I was horrible. I was like my family didn't like to be around me um, my dad didn't talk to me it was really hard and just the changes that have come with this program and everybody and the whole school has changed so much and it's like it's so amazing <laughs> like I can't even tell you guys like the like sitting in a classroom before the violence free zone was like a chore you did not want to be there you hated it now you can actually learn because kids aren't fighting or yelling at the teachers or talking back and it's helped so much with everybody and the personal issues that they help you deal with it's like you've never I've never experienced anything like the violence free zone. It seems to me that the mentors teach us more than the teachers do because they teach us about life and they teach us how to be strong and how to get through all of our struggles and all the stuff and all the crap that's going to come your way no matter what you do. They teach you how to get through it and how to be strong through it all. And if you guys take away this program, you're going to take away all of our chances. And that's all I have to say. Thank you. Dixie Leopolis. Can I defer to later on? I'm sorry, what? I don't want to go ahead of any parent or grandparent that has a card in. Well, I... Okay. I just want to uh, thank you, Mayor Harris, and... Vice Mayor Smith and council members for revisiting this. Uh, we've just been so blessed to have Bob Woodson a part of our the interest in our community since 1999, and this is a major part of the Leaders Training Leaders initiative that's been on the back burner for a long time. And what we're seeing happen on the campuses is just a model of what can happen out through the other segments of the community. And as an employer for 40 some years, my passion about this is that my mission has been to take young women that came into my place of business that had no idea of their self-worth, their self-identity, the potential that they had, and teach them, not just to make a living through the processing of escrows, but to make a life by being a part of a relationship-driven experience. And most of my time as an employer, I didn't have huge dollars to give to a lot of things. We were supportive of a lot, but my money went into putting to work the, the enthusiasm, the brightness that these young women had. Oftentimes, they did work with experienced people, too, in my office that had the same mission. But to, to help them see that life was good and that they had a future and a hope. And so to think that we actually have this on our campuses now that are giving them the skill. I taught life more than I taught escrow <laughs> from many of the ones that we hired. And now there's another program through <clears throat> Antelope Valley Partners for Health, a collaborative that I'm on that board, that is United We Mentor. And that's on the junior high, the middle school campuses. So if we can start this as it is being done on the middle school campuses where these 
young people that are so discouraged before they ever enter high school can see that they do have a future and a hope, then we're really all on the right track, and I cannot encourage you enough to just do the right thing on this. Let's make it happen. Thank you. Uh, Patricia Markham. Markham? I know I butchered the name, so you'll have to help me. Mayor, council people, my, my name is Patricia Marquam. At least that's how I pronounce it, and I just inherited it through my husband. Um, the reason that I've come to speak to you all is because for two weeks I hadn't seen anyone in the violence-free zone, and as soon as I saw the first member step back this week on the violence-free zone, I ran up to him and I said, I am so glad to see you all here. They helped me so much. I work with special ed students. There was one gang member. He was trying to talk his younger brothers and sisters not joining the gang in his class. Then I was uh, gifted with a very special educational challenged child and the only, but only person, the only people, the only lifeguard, the only salvation that I could see in this educational system was the violence-free zone. There was no conventional method of dealing with this child. And they simply made him do push-ups and they would talk to him, calm him down. If you take the violence-free zone and you don't fund it, you are going to do an injustice to a lot of the potential kids that have a bright future ahead. That's all. Is it Mel Tane? Tane or is it oh, Lane. Mel Lane? Lane. No. Mel, no? you got to make a better L. <laughs> ah, better L. <laughs> you should see it the way I usually make it. <laughs> uh, good evening, Mr. Mayor and Vice Mayor and the Council members. Uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak before you this evening. The reason I'm here is I'm the president of the Greater Antelope Valley Economic Alliance. and. Uh, I work in conjunction with your economic development department as well as other five cities within the Antelope Valley, their economic development. And what I found over the last uh, year and a half is that businesses are not looking as closely at, well, they're still looking at it, but not, it's not number one in the agenda, at the cost of doing business, city taxes, quality of life, and all of those things. But what, what they're looking at now, which is number one that they look at, is crime index within the city. And so uh, at the Outlook Conference last year when I gave a report how that Palmdale and Lancaster were both below the national average for cities across the United States, it drew an applause. It not only drew an applause from the people here in the community, but it drew applause for the businesses that we're trying to attract and locate to the Antelope Valley. And so I would encourage you to do anything you can to keep that keep that momentum going to try to keep uh, crime at, at a level where we can still attract businesses and bring them to the area. On a personal note, I support wholeheartedly uh, going forward with the program. My wife and I over the years have been committed to helping children at risk and kids at risk and we had 18 of them live with us while our own four boys were growing up and we've supported about 30 in their education and everything and I still support some to this day. The amount that the council is being asked to give is something that I have committed on a personal basis for a number of years. And so I think that you guys have, have a real chance here to be able to make a, a monument statement to the community and to the rest of California. And that is that this would be the first violence-free zone city and, and area in, in uh, west of, of the Mississippi. That's something that we can all but look back with with pride and I hope that you will consider that as you look, look at supporting this. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Frankie Johnson. Mr. Mayor, Vice Mayor, Council Members. I learned that from all these big wigs that came up here on there. Thank you. My name is Frankie Johnson. 
And um, I'm grandmother to Sarah I'm over here. You know, when, when, when that happens to me, and believe it or not, it still does happen to me occasionally, I just take a really deep breath. And it... Well, it's just a few of the tears that we've cried over this child. Um, for 13 years, we have loved her, tried to help her, raise her, give her every chance we could. But she was so unreachable. When she first started talking about her mentor, I thought it was another program at school. It isn't going to work. Because we had tried so many different ways to come at her to help, and nothing worked. <clears throat> and then I hear about this violence-free zone. First time was maybe four weeks ago, the first meeting I went to. And I don't know how they do what they do. I don't know how they reach these kids. But Sarah is so different after five months that our family can be a family and not the struggle it had been for so long. They have given her something we couldn't with all our love and all our care. And what I want to make real clear is Sarah's not from down below. She's not a problem that moved up here. My grandchildren are fifth generation Valleyites. This is home. Always has been, always will be. And for these people to come in and do something for my family that I couldn't, amazes me. I don't even pretend to understand. Am I out of time? No, you got a few more seconds. Okay. okay. All I want to say is, whatever they do, however it works, if you can keep it here, you will give Sarah and all the other kids like her one thing the rest of us have not been able to give, and that's a fighting chance, and I hope you'll do that. Thank you. Serena Ochoa. Good afternoon. My name is Serena Ochoa. I have an IEP son, special ed. Um, my son, I'm going to say it real. He's a basket case. Okay. F's, truancy ticket. The words, talking back, disrespecting at home, didn't care. These are my son's, these are my son's awards. To everybody didn't know it, these are his awards. This right here might be a paper to some of the people. This right here is my son's best thing he's achieved. He's 16. Okay, he's on the football team now. We would never thought that. But with the violence free zone, he com coming into the violence free zone, he accomplished a lot. He went from F's to A's, B, and C's. Cody was his counselor, youth advisor. He has a father. Sean has a father, but he's a worker, you know, trying to get that money, pay their bills. But he wasn't always there. So for the first time when I sat down to show my son, my, his father, his headline report, all his dad used to always see was F's, 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 F's. When he seen the headline report, A's, B's, and C's. His father started crying. My son was shocked. Like, what did I do wrong now? He figured it out. He, my, these were tears of joy. He got A's, B's, and C's. His father told him for the first time, I'm proud of you. My son went and told everybody, my dad said he's proud of me. These papers have made it all the way to Chicago. He's emailing them to all his family members. Because Sean doesn't achieve things like this. He gives up. I'm a, I'm a strong parent. I don't like to give up. But fighting a young man that's 16, want to be in a gang member, 
All that, no. I'm a neighborhood watch broadcaster since 2001. I've seen a lot of these kids out there fighting. I got out of my truck, stopped them fighting, beat me up. Okay? But, you know what? And when I go into, they let me go into the, the room. Emma lets me go into the room for the um, girl real talk and the guy real talk. Usually you can't go in for the guys. But he let me sneak in there. And I seen a lot of these guys in there that was fighting out there in the street. Some of these girls that put their hands on me. I seen them in there and they changed. They really are. I go to a lot, a lot of meetings. And I can definitely tell you these kids have changed. But please, allow this, this program to come to, back to Eastside High. You will not regret it. It's worth the money. Thank you. Thank you. Pamela Palmer. Hi. I'm not going to cry. Um, I was just kind of listening to everybody and what they had to say. And one of the things that I know um, didn't get said was that um, Priya and Eric were Sarah's mentors. And they were not just available to her at school, at lunch, on break, or when she needed help at school. They were available 24-7. So they, they would take a phone call at 10.30 at night, at 2.30 in the morning when she couldn't sleep. So they're, you're not just getting them at this very small slot. You're getting them all day, every day. Sarah has a mom and a dad and siblings at home. She's not alone. I'm very, very open with my children. I've been able to talk a lot of their friends through a lot of things. Always thought I could talk to all of my girls about everything. Sometimes they just can't talk to you. Sometimes, no matter how much you love them, how close you are, and how open you believe the relationship is, they need somebody on the outside, somebody who just listens and doesn't necessarily judge or get that disappointed look that you're trying not to show them as they're being really open to you, but you are anyways, okay? Also, I've grown up here my whole life. This valley is much, much more aggressive than it was when I went through high school in 85. I'm always telling my girls, just let it roll, just ignore them. Don't make eye contact with other students that are much more aggressive than you. Okay, used to be don't talk to strangers meant don't talk to adults. We all went, you know, out Halloween. It was don't talk to the big people. Now it's like just stay away from the kids too. Don't talk to anybody. This anger gets built up in them. They're tired of being pushed around. They don't know how else to handle it. So when they get to where they've had a confrontation at lunch or before school, and they're ready to blow, and they're trying not to blow because they don't want to be suspended again, but they've got the same kid on the next break or the next lunch break, standing right behind them, poking and prodding. They have a classroom they can go to that they can talk to somebody who's not going to say, well, nothing's happened yet. So if something happens, then come back up and talk to me. They help my child and all the other children in the program work through that and walk back out with that deep breath and say, I'm okay now. So they don't get into the fight, they don't have the confrontation, and they're not being suspended. So I know for Sarah, it has been a wonderful, wonderful thing for her. She's not angry every day, all day, from the time she wakes up because she doesn't want to go to school. And because of that, she's been able to apply herself better. So she's getting much better grades. So this, for us, has been a fantastic program, and I'd hate to see it leave. Thank you. Philip Cruz. Hello, my name's Philip Cruz. I'm uh, the daughter of uh, Darlene Cruz. Um, this is something I've never done. You're the, you're the father of the family. <laughs> Sorry, I'm the father. Like, like I said, I mean, this is something I've never done before. I've never actually stepped up in front of a council of, of any city. I've I've been a uh, uh, a gang member for uh, a good portion of my life, and um, you know, if something like this would have been in the schools where I was 
it would have been a different story. I mean, not to point anybody out, but, you know, the, the one that attracts my attention is the gentleman with the tattoos on his head. I mean, no offense, but I mean, so, so, something like that. I mean, if, if somebody actually came into the school that looked like that, you know, for me, for my personal and my background, it would it would attract my attention, you know. And I've had Darlene for a little over two years now. And um, when she first came up here, it was real hard for me to get along with her. And God, I don't even know why I'm getting all emotional here. <laughs> it's okay. But um. You know, she said she went to East uh, to Lancaster High School. You know, and she got nothing but but trouble from that, from being in this school. And uh, I don't know. It was worked out where I had a, a PP principal to principal transfer from Lancaster High School to Eastside High School. And um, all I could hear her talk about was this violence-free program and uh, how she wanted to be a part of it and everything. And uh, you know, when she was going to Lancaster, it was like she didn't want to go to school. She kept telling me, Dad, I don't want to go to school. I don't want to go to school. But it's, now it's like she's excited to go to school, you know. And it's, it's I, I don't know, it's, if, it's, if it's taken away, it's just like it, 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 it'll just bring back what was already there, you know, the, the, the crime. Because, I mean, I don't know if I misunderstood, but like 10%, you know, I was one of those 10% that would manipulate and have people come my way to do the things that I wanted to do, which were bad things, you know. And if we can decrease that, you know, and actually have good kids. I've heard the other, the other lady mention about her, um, somebody bringing, you know, telling the other kids not to join the gangs and stuff like that and trying to keep it away from them, you know. Stuff like that, that that's encouraging, you know. And if, if I mean, if, if something, if a program in a school is actually doing something like that, why take it away, you know. I mean, I, I wish I would have had it back in the days, you know. But, I mean, this is the way I've grown up. And, you know, to see my daughter doing the way she is, I, I'm just proud of it. And I just hope you guys keep it. Thank you. Okay, let's close the public discussion. Well, wait a minute. I don't... Also, if I can inquire, we had a Brenda Scott. What did you want to speak on? You didn't write it down, ma'am. Was it on this? This came in before you closed it. I just had to All right, uh, Janine Robinson. Hi, I'm a student at Eastside High School. My name is Janae Robinson. My mentor is Tiffany Manning. And when Eastside first brought the violence freeze on, I was suspended from school for fighting. I stayed in trouble. Tickets, cussing out teachers, getting into it with them, fighting anybody who wanted to fight me. When they came, I sat down. First, I talked to Katina, which is not here. She was my mentor at first. First, I was like, nah, they ain't going to help me. I'm just going to go in there and talk, see what they're talking about, and it ain't going to be no change. After going there for so many weeks, they became my friends. I can go in there and talk to them about anything or any situation. Anytime I got a problem, if I can't talk to my mom, I can talk to one of them. The whole time they was at our school, it was nothing but a change and a difference. When they told me they were supposed to come back for summer school, I was like, okay, at least y'all going to be here for summer school. Y'all going to be around me. They didn't come back. I felt bad about that. Then we started school back. They weren't there. Ever since they haven't been at our school, there is, everything is going back to the way it used to be. Fights every day, people getting tickets for being tardy, everybody coming late, disrespect towards teachers. They were there, they had a plan in progress, but they didn't finish their plan. They didn't have enough time to finish it. So I'm like hoping that you guys really give them the money and put in the effort and time for them to come back to our school because I need it and mostly all the students at that school need it right now. That's all. Linda Scott. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you for allowing me to speak. I think all of us that are here today have a really good story to tell about the violence-free zone. Um, it is a, um, 
intervention program for our at-risk kids. And I don't think a lot of us as parents really realize our kids are what is considered at risk until something has happened. Um, for me, it was, it was a very trying time with, with my son because we went through a barrage of changes and my husband and I did everything that we could to address the problems that we felt that he was having. But when the Violence Free Zone program came along, it served another purpose to help him. Um, these advocates and project directors from the Violence Free Zone are able to mirror the behavior of a lot of these at-risk kids. So they already know what the children are going through even before they actually get to that point. Um, I found that many times they're able to tell the children what can be and what will be. What can be is that they can learn to make positive and decisive choices and choose to become productive members of society. What, what will be is that, to, that society will not tolerate them in that condition. Everyone that I've met in the Violence Free Zone has their own story to tell. They've already been there, they've already done that, and so they are able to tell these kids, they are able to show them that there is another way, and to show them that there is hope for them. They um, are able to help our children build and boost self-esteem. They are able to help them make positive choices, to point them in the right direction. I don't think the effects of this program will be seen for a long, long, long time. We're only just seeing the crust of it right now, and it's, it's really a good change. We have no way of knowing as, as, as parents and as community people and as lay people, we don't know yet what we have in these children coming out of these, pro, out of this, these programs. We could have do, uh, doctors and lawyers. We could have carpenters. We could have, we could have contractors. Uh, we don't know. But if we don't give them a chance to find out who they can be so that they can take it back into the communities in which they live, we will be doing a terrible disservice to these children. We are, we are parents. I think everyone here that is a parent can relate to having a child who just simply sometimes just needs the guidance of someone who knows better, a little better than they do. When my son came to me about, um, and I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Mr. Mayor, but when my son came to me, I didn't know what to tell him about gangs, drugs, and violence. But it does exist, and these people certainly do their job. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, now we're closed, right? Okay. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, a couple of things I just want to mention to you. First of all, thank you so very much. And I hope I don't offend anybody behind me, but we had our program set out, and that was for myself to introduce Mr. Morrell, school official, and Mr. Lott, and that's what we had on the agenda. So we just want you to know that we did not orchestrate that. So please receive that from me on that. The other thing is I want to mention, not that it wasn't valuable, and we do appreciate uh, everything. Thank you for listening to all of them. Mr. Mann and I were talking earlier that uh, really I think a few of us in this room uh, could really push the envelope a little bit and get out where some people are, and I think we can probably come up with some money uh, from some of the people in the community to help us with this. But whatever you can do for this, God knows I would appreciate it, and I'm sure everybody else will. Whatever decision you make, we'll support it. Thank you. I had a couple things. Um, first of all, I heard over and over, don't take this program away, and I don't think we're doing that. The city of Lancaster is not doing that. I had a couple of questions. Um, what funds have you received so far?
Again, David Vieira, superintendent with the Allen Valley Union High School District. Um, to answer your question, approximately $5,000 has been raised to this date. Okay. Would you mind telling me who's um, given that? I know 2000 of that was from uh, Mr. Woodson himself. Mm -hmm. And do you know? Just various community uh, family members. Okay, so just, from just individuals. Yes. Okay. Individuals. Okay. Um, as I understand it, the city of Lancaster has committed $75,000 if it's matching funds. That is correct. Right. Um, the other thing I wanted to know, is this volunteer or is it mandatory? I mean, if someone gets into trouble so many times, is it mandatory that they take this, that they be a part of this program? This initially is voluntary. Now, whether the sites have taken some discretion on their part as a, in lieu of suspension could be a possibility, but it's a voluntary system. Okay. Um, where else have you taken your cause? Where else have you spoken to? Uh, I specifically have spoken with uh, Price Charities, a gentleman by the name of Ted Price, based out of San Diego, who is uh, considering, but I have not got a response at this time. I believe Mr. Neal has also spoken to uh, some community members here in town as well, and businesses. Okay, thank you. Um, the um, I, I don't know how the rest of the council feels about it, but I look at this, and unfortunately, I don't see it as a public safety issue. Um, you know, I think I'm at a disadvantage, to be very um, truthful with you. Uh, I'm a military brat, so I've always lived on military bases. If you messed up, you took responsibility for it. Um, at one time, I know my children um, were in high school, in public school, and there were some kids that seemed to be hanging around and and I didn't like the looks of them and I specifically told my children I was working at full time and I said you start messing up and I will quit my job and I will walk with you to school I will sit with you in school and I will walk home from school with you and um, she'd do it too I, I, oh they knew I was serious um, so I think, I think somewhat that I'm at a disadvantage. I understand what everybody's saying. Um, unfortunately, I think for so many years, the authority has been taken away from the right people in schools and that there's a lot of parents that won't take responsibility. Um, I want a violence-free zone because guess what? Eastside High School is in my neighborhood. But, um... That's all I'll say right now. Thanks. Thank you. Any other questions, council members? Could I make one? Could I make a comment, Mayor? Um, Ms. Mark, you make a good point. This is a program I know that's come before you this evening, and the question is you're taking it away. And that's a tough thing to hear, number one. And secondly, just to remind folks where we currently stand is that this is a program that initially started with the city of Palmdale back last year. The city of Lancaster did step up last year and did partner for the 75000 and has this year as well. Like Mr. Lott had stated, unfortunately, with the reduction in our funds of approximately $6 million, we're looking at a declining enrollment right now. We've had many discussions. We're not able to enhance it any more than we currently do. That's not to say that the district doesn't take safety as a number one priority, because it does. This board has put dollars forward to the tune of about seven and a half million dollars when you combine the uh, contract with the Sheriff's Department and security as well. But I don't think that the question before this evening is really one on viability of the program. I think that we've seen some of the positive aspects of that. It's really uh, down to the, the dollars and cents and of where we currently are. But again, I thank you for your partnership, the ongoing partnerships and and uh, trust that the decision made here tonight is one that's appropriate and one that we will uh, support. Mm -hmm. Mr. Mayor, a question, please? Yes. Mr. Vieira. Yes. Um, maybe you can tell us how many dollars has the city of Palmdale put in this year? This year, $150,000. Which was? Which is the four hundred out of their Out of their budget? My understanding is, well, my understanding and I read in the newspaper today it was A.C. Warnock that put up the 150000 but... Uh, it's my understanding that the other 75000 was A.C. Warnock, whether it was 100% or 50%, I don't know. Okay. But it, there was private funds that matched 
Palm Bills? I mean, they put up seventy five thousand out of their budget, and then it was matched by E.C. Warnock. Or did I don't know if there was a contingency on matching on their part. I just know that there was one hundred fifty thousand dollars, and the additional amount was through Mr. Warnock. Yes. I think Mr. Bazigan wanted to make a, make a statement. I'd just like to point out a couple facts as well, too, and without disparaging the program, there, it clearly has had an impact. Okay, I will say that the numbers that have been reported to us by the group don't match the testimonials. Okay, but I will clearly say that it had an impact. I would also point out that this city is facing a state budget issue where we may lose another three million dollars. We also cut our budget by seven million dollars, um, and we are the only public entity so far in the Antelope Valley that has contributed to this program taxpayer funds, general funds. I'd also say that I agree with Mr. Vieira that attendance is an issue, and uh, this council has funded a truancy car, which is going to help with attendance too. So, um, and maybe I shouldn't, but uh, this city is not taking this program away from anyone. This city has stepped up. Let me let me ask a question again uh, on the truancy, Mr. Vieira. If uh, I think I've heard the estimate, we're paying three hundred fifty thousand dollars. Uh, this year for getting a truancy car out there to put your kids back in school. If, you, if we reduce your truancy by 1% on the money that you're going to get from the state from that attendance, what, what estimated 1 that would be? 1% was approximately, I think, $1.5 million to us with, with ADA faculty right. attendance. And that, that currently, I believe, as a, a good financial person Absolutely. as you are, has not been budgeted into your budget. No, the money, the dollars aren't there yet. Yeah, budget what we don't have. Right, and 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 I think I would chime in with Mr. Bazigian and, and Ms. Marcus also is that the, the people who have come here today, it's heartfelt. It's a great, it, you've had great experiences. The city of Lancaster is not taking this program away. Uh, in fact, we're putting by spending three hundred fifty thousand dollars, this could possibly give the school district one point five million dollars. Um, it's a matter of priorities for the school district, and, and you guys have, well, we're not going to tell you how to set your priorities. You, your board has set its priorities. This program was not one of your priorities. We, we put up $75,000 to match it. Um, maybe AC Warnock can chip in another seventy-five. That's unfair. You know, but, um, yeah, I mean, it's not saying anything about the program, but um, I think... Uh, Any other comments? Yeah, Mr. Mayor, I'd like to. <clears throat> clearly, I, I want to make sure I, I know that we've heard several comments tonight about potentially taking the program away, and, and <clears throat> I concur with my fellow council members. My preference, uh, and I spoke kind of offline with uh, with with Henry, and my preference would be to. I know the school has already started. Is to maybe give them. A period of time. I don't think we're saying that we're going to take the money away. We've committed seventy-five thousand. I'd like to see maybe a, a grassroots effort, maybe some some effort taken upon whether it's the people that came before us tonight and spoke, and and some of the people with the program, is to give them an opportunity, say thirty days or forty-five, whatever, potentially may be viable to keep the program moving forward, and let them see if they can't solicit and get funds from the community. Um, it was also my interpretation that that uh, that Palmdale's program was funded all with private funds. I could be mistaken as well. So well, I thought too. I thought it was... Con but I don't, I, I don't, again, I, I don't think we're trying to take the program away. I think that that we need to have some some responsible cooperation and I think that I would be willing to table it for 30 or 45 days or a duration of responsible time and let them see if they can't raise some money. You know, That's my I, thoughts. My understanding right now is they have five thousand dollars, and if we're matching dollars, that would give them ten thousand dollars, and that should be enough to get the program or whatever they need for them to be able to match the other the other money. You know, if I could make one more comment on the truancy card and everything, it's it's also a philosophical thing of you know the program. There there are. A plethora of great programs and great things out there um, that 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 the city could give money for. But I think by us giving our money to the truancy car, it not only spends the money the way the city is supposed to spend the money and taking care of the crime in the city property.
but also benefits the school district at the same time. And just giving money to programs that don't directly benefit, government has to look at where their money goes and is it used judicial, judiciously for the programs that they need to implement. And uh, I know everybody's tight right now. but uh, So maybe we can do the, the matching. You know, $10,000 might be able to get you going until you can get some kind of uh, private money up. That's Mr. Councilman Manset. What I've heard tonight is a lot of testimonials, some from the 10 percent. And I know where you're coming from. I was one of the 10 percent. I know what it feels like when you have handcuffs put on. It changes your life. So I understand how important this program is, can be, and I believe will be. But some things need to happen. Our city has said we've got $75,000 we're willing to put up, but something's got to happen on the other side. You've come up with five. As has been said, the high school board has set their priorities. Frankly, and I'm not picking on literature, I never liked that class. <laughs> Do you need another literature class? Can you lose one and put some money into this program? I think it will come back and will reward the district in spades because there are students who wouldn't be there if it weren't for the violence-free zone. Setting aside what, can, what Vice Mayor Smith said about the truancy card, and I believe all those numbers are accurate and, and everything you said is absolutely true, but the dollars you get back from keeping the kids in school I think will pay off immediately. I like the idea of releasing some funds now. Um, Perhaps we can be a bit more generous. It takes time to, to raise funds. But know that the city is willing to put up money, and we have. When it's gone, it's gone. If you've done your part and have raised the matching funds and have gotten private enterprise or, or prominent individuals or whoever you can to, to put money into the cause, you've done your job. We've done our part. We need to see the same thing on your side. If let I may make a comment. David, let, let me comment. And I think that's precisely the, the reason we find ourselves in this mess. Um, it is our job to arrest people. It is our job to fund the police. It is our job to be, at times when necessary, a paramilitary presence. It is our job to make the citizens of this community safe. It is the school's job to educate the students and to make it a safe environment to do so in. Let's, let's not get confused about that. The, this, and you know, I'm, I'm very sympathetic to these types of things, and, and I think I've demonstrated that over the years. But now I'm the mayor. I'm not a businessman. And as a mayor, this morning I, I was struggling with this, this issue, and a very wise woman sent me an email. In, in the email, there was the story of how Davy Crockett uh, had given $20,000 to the burn victims of Washington, D.C., and then when the election turned around, somebody said he was never going to vote for him because he gave them that. You know, they voted, the U.S. government voted. And the reason they were never going to give it to him is because, never vote for him, is because that wasn't his, his role. It was the role of Congress to defend the nation. And now what we have is because of that $75,000 vote, we have all you folks here justifiably thinking that it is our job to fund this program. And when, when you have students come up and you see impact like that, your, your heart breaks and, yeah, I want to fund the program. But where's the authority for me to do that? You know, this is not a bottomless pit of money. That, that I get to spend whenever my heart tells me that, that I can write a check and, and make things better. It, it's my job as mayor, and it's this council's job as councilmen to protect the citizens of this community. And for us to start merging these roles redefines what, what we've been elected to do, and it redefines the nature of government. You know, L.A. just went through this when the, the mayor of L.A. wanted to take over the school district because he thought he could administer it better. You know, how close are we to that with this? Aren't you saying that I should reach into your house and tell you how to run your house? You know, I, I, I don't know that you want me to do that. The, the, the merging of the roles here is becoming 
very uncomfortable. And what deputy should I lay off? What two deputies should I lay off to fund this program? Because that's what you're asking me to do. I mean, all the money is spent. Where, who do I lay off? And it would be very easy for me to sit here and stay silent and not say anything and let this thing die. But we're coming to the wrong well. And I, I think we have to stop doing it. Because, because when that happens, these kids are not served. And I think we should absolutely do whatever's necessary to prevent these kids from taking their, their place in the cell that's waiting for them. Because that's really how we, we've been dealing with this as a society. Uh, you know, hopefully the Criminal Justice Commission is going to redefine these roles for us and tell us what is the school's responsibility, what is the city's responsibility, and let's not mix them up anymore because we're confusing everybody. The, the, if there's somebody that needs to be laid off, perhaps it does have to be in the school district. But I also have a, have a problem with the way we've been approaching this in the past. I mean, it, it, I've seen it a hundred times in this council. Somebody comes in and, and, and persuades the council to spend the people's money in ways that really isn't appropriate. You know, th there's a lot of science out there that tells us what's working. And if you can't demonstrate with the numbers that something's cost effective, I, I think we're, we're being terrible stewards of the money if we start spending it in ways that, that solve the, soothe our heart, uh, the, the pangs in our heart. And, and that's really what, what's being presented here today. You know, Diana Beard Williams did a, did a wonderful analysis of this. And yes, this program's a great program for the children that it's affecting. No question about that. You guys are doing wonderful work with it. But when you do a cost-benefit analysis of it, you know, I, how am I a good steward in saying let's let's fund this thing, knowing that there is no way that it's going to be funded next year? I mean, I, I the, the, nobody has any idea how this thing gets funded next year. And if you if you want to come and say, do we want to spend a million dollars on a program? Then tell me it's a million dollars on a program because we're going to have to fund it for the next ten years. But to do it piecemeal, I think, is irresponsible of us not to ask those questions. Where's the money coming from next year? There is no idea where it's coming from. The the, the which brings me the, which brings me back though to the the real issue. Do you want me up here spending your money because my heart tells me that I want to I want to spend it for something that I want to take care of something? Or should I use my personal money for it? You know, I'll match your $5,000 and I'll match it out of my personal account. And there's a lot of other people in this room that are capable of doing that and it would not affect their standard of living one iota. And if they want to do that, pretty soon we'd have that $75,000. But don't ask me to take it from the citizens. That's not what they elected me to do. And I think in the future, before we start saying we'll put matching funds on anything, we better really ask ourselves, is that our role? And if it is our role, why are we doing matching funds? Shouldn't we be doing all of it? If this is the school's role, the school should make the decision. And, I, and if I were you, David, and, and you know that, that I've loved you for years, I, I think you're a magnificent superintendent. But tonight I'd be a little embarrassed if I were you, because this really is the school's responsibility. There, there's nothing for us to vote on tonight. If somebody wants to put it on the agenda and have us vote, we'll vote. But that's what my brain is telling me, despite what my heart is telling me. Mayor, what's your thoughts about <clears throat> giving them 30 days and bringing it back? I think that the way I would like to run this city is you're free to bring it back at any time. Okay. But understand, this is what your mayor's thinking. Well, my question to Councilman Mann is what are you going to be bringing back? Well, my thought process, as I spoke of earlier, is to allow them to, well, I'm going to assume that then uh, we're leaving it open. So if they come back in three months and they find the matching funds, we're just going to proceed just like as if we were to tonight then? No, we Sorry. don't need to bring anything back. It's okay. in the budget. It's, right. in the 09, it's in the 08 09 budget. It's okay. over 75000 sure. matching funds. I, I don't think okay. any uh, council action needs to trigger to okay. pay for it. That is correct. Sure. As long as there's clarity there. I just wanted to make sure what you well, well, sure. I also want to be clear on this, that any of you are free to bring a motion to take it out of the budget. 
because I, I think we're going down a slippery slope. I think it's our job to protect the citizens of this community, and we should do so with as many deputies as necessary. And we should do, do it with as heavy a hand as necessary. It is not our job to educate the students as much as I want to. That is not the role of this council. And if somebody wants to put it on the budget to reestablish what the, our roles are, I'm more than willing to, to we'll, we will certainly entertain it. Can we go on? Thank you. City Manager, you have any announcements? No, sir. City Clerk? Ladies and gentlemen, this time, at this time, this is the time for people to address the council on items that are not on the agenda. You may fill out a speaker card, which you'll find at the back of the council chambers on the table. We ask that you fill the cards out completely and clearly as poss possible so that if necessary, the council and the city staff can get in touch with you if necessary. Individual speakers are limited to three minutes each. You will see three lights on the podium. The green light comes on when you begin. The yellow light comes on when you have 30 seconds left. And the red light comes on when your time is up. We ask that you be considerate of the allotted time to allow other speakers to have their three minutes as well. State law does prohibit the city council from taking action on items that are not on the agenda, and your matter will be referred to the city manager. Thank you. Cleo Goss. You have only to ask, Cleo. Okay. According to the 2007 Southern California Association of Governments Economic Report on Lancaster, a majority, 56% of Lancaster households, have an annual income of less than $50,000. Of those, half are below $25,000. AV residents with the highest paying jobs work in either the manufacturing or the federal government fields. This is the salary of the high paying jobs. Okay, um, middle income jobs are in the construction and healthcare fields. Due to the housing meltdown and the economy, the number of construction workers has likely de decreased significantly since this publication. The report identified the largest numbers of workers are found in the lowest paying jobs. These are retail sales and food services. Retail sales workers bring in less than $36,000 a year, and food service workers earn a little over $13,000. People cannot afford to raise a family on this amount of money without government assistance or holding a second job. These low-income jobs are the kind of jobs a super center fast food complex creates. Building two super centers across the street from Courtsville High School may provide plenty of low-paying jobs for students, but it will not help the students in the long run. Historically, when jobs are scarce, people seek to improve their marketability by continuing their education. The report identified the enrollment in AV College has been flat or declining in the last four years. And the low number of college-educated people in the Antelope Valley is the reason why the high-paying, white-collar firms are hesitant to move into the area. The report listed high crime, low rate of college degrees, and lack of affluent retail centers as Lancaster's weaknesses in attracting higher-paying businesses. Another two discount complexes does not widen the diversity of shopping opportunities the report identified as being needed to reduce retail leakage to other cities and capture a larger share of residents' spending. Lancaster needs more upscale stores and restaurants instead of discount stores and fast food. Lancaster should focus on increasing high and middle income jobs such as uh, manufacturing and local government, since Lancaster has no control over the medical fields or federal jobs. Okay? Thank you. <laughs> you want this? Yes, I do. Thank you. Okay, and I would, um, one more question. I'd yes, like to remind you that uh, this coming up week, it'll be 30 days since you promise to have a status report on this? Okay. Uh, I'm out of the country for two weeks. 
when I get back, can I do it? Will you give me one more week? Well, as long as they aren't doing anything. But I already no, heard not, that no, Walmart they're... is out there taking petition signatures to say they want to shuffle their, their shoppers from Lancaster Valley Central Way to Quartz Hill. But, but I, that's what Walmart does. What, what you're talking about is, are the, is the city going to do anything? There's nothing uh, on the agendas of anything that for the city. Right, but you promised that you would give a status report to that's the right, Hill residents. And, but I'm not going to be here to do it. Okay. Okay, but I know that it is being prepared. Okay. Okay, and as soon as I get back, I got a chance to meet Margaret Thatcher. I want to go meet her. <laughs> All right, as long as as long as we have some status on this. Okay. Right. Well, you, you will. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I can't pronounce this last name. Veronica. I'm not even gonna okay. That's okay, nobody else can do it. Hi. Hi. My name is Veronica Mignot. Um, I saw Mr. Mann and yourself over at the um, Share Tolerance uh, News Conference. And basically, there's two reasons why I'm here today. Um, we, you know, especially after, you know, all this that you guys were just talking about, we um, have realized that it's very difficult for us to request any money from the city. But um, I'm actually here to request um, for any of you city council um, to attend the AIDS walk that we will be having this year. Um, there's actually two things that are happening. We have the um, sixth annual AIDS walk and we also have an abuse. It's called the AV Block Party, but it's actually an abuse awareness prevention um, thing that we're putting on. I um, am meeting with different um, uh, facilities that go out and help the people with AIDS and we were really working hard to get this and to raise the money and we've had a lot of difficulty reaching anybody or getting a response so I thought I would come up and personally invite um, any and all of you to attend these. We do have some other people that have agreed to be there but we actually need Grand Marshal and um, really to show the, the people in the, in the city that you are really supportive. These are two totally different events. One is on October 4th and one is on October 19th. If, if I'm in town, I will do it. And we would make certain you write those dates down so that I'll be there. Okay. Thank you for the invitation. Okay, thank okay. you. I think we've also notified all council members of those dates as well, too. Okay, okay. thank you. Okay, Scott Pelka. At the last council meeting, uh, Mr. Smith seemed to take the city backwards a little bit in trying to uh, bring back up again the uh, elections and moving the elections uh, since we wanted to move back to November and he wanted to keep them the same and about five people came up here from the city and requested that the uh, um, oh, that's, that's the uh, situation but I mean you know, people came up and you know uh, had said that we should leave the elections alone and everything else and and uh, seems but he seems to want to go backwards on it and you wanted to go backwards on the La Sala situation and trying to re uh, regurgitate that contract up again and five people uh, from the city or from the citizens here came up and said that we shouldn't go backwards on it one person came up and spoke for, in favor of it which was uh, uh, Miss uh, uh, Miss Williams who's not a resident of Lancaster uh, and then Miss Marcus or excuse me Marquez however you want to pronounce it Marcus uh, it rhymes with carcass yes I understand that the dead issue but uh, you spoke up and you decided you you want to make English the official language of Lancaster, and that's kind of going backwards. Uh, since back in 19, back in the what was it the early 60s, uh, when um, Rosa Parks came out and decided not to give up her seat on the bus, and it's, you know, are we going backwards here in Lancaster? I mean, do we really need something to racially divide the city? Uh, you know, there's citizens here who uh, you know want to come up here and speak. And no matter whether they can speak English or not, it's not right to try to segregate people here. I mean, what's next in the council here? We're going to have, you know, whites only in the front of the room, and colored people and Hispanic people in the back of the room. Are we going to have a whites in the colored water fountain in the back of the council chamber? This is getting ridiculous. 
You know, yeah, it really is getting ridiculous. This is America. That I mean, accusation is absolutely ridiculous. Yes, yeah, and this, you know, this, you is, know, this is America. You, why, did, why are we I've even bringing this up? I've got to, I've got to let you talk. But yes, you, you calling her a racist yes. is beyond the pale. It's beyond the pale. You know, what she said, first of all, listen to her last name. Uh-huh. Listen to her last yes. name, and you're calling her a racist? Yes, Where do you get absolutely. Off? Where do you get off doing that? What she said, what she said last week is that she is concerned about America losing its identity. And since that time, she has worked the last two weeks trying to figure out what is the best way to handle this. And I think she's come up with a very good solution, as a matter of fact. But for you to call her a racist because she wants to preserve America's identity and even imply, even imply for one second that this community would tolerate any type of racist crap that you're spewing is, is simply a lie and you know it. And you absolutely know it. What this council has done in regards to racial uh, 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 mixing, what do you, what do you call it? Uh, huh? Diversity, bringing diversity into the city is more than any city in the high desert has ever done, has ever done. And for you to sit there and even imply for one second that we are in any way being racist in what we're doing is, is despicable and it is even beneath you, Mr. Pelka, and that is hard for me to believe, that anything is beneath you. But, you, but I saw it today. I saw it today. Now, do you, now, I took some of your time, and if you want to say something else, do it. But don't you ever sit there and call me a racist, because it just doesn't fit. I will call the shoe to fit where it lies. If you're sitting here telling me that what I'm saying is uh, that, you know, that she's I'm You not came racist, up here and just did this clever little dance did, about you, why? white only, white only why? drinking fountains. Where the hell do you get off? Where do I get off? When somebody comes up here, this is America. You know, America is full of diversity. Everybody from every, this the entire country is one big melting pot. That's right, pot. that's right. And you look, one big melting pot. You look at the commissions, you look at the commissions in this city me, and tell me they've ever been this diverse. You tell, tell me that, that this council, this council, hasn't done more for diversity in this community than has ever been done in the history of this community. Up until and two weeks ago, and sit there and try to paint us with that brush is Excuse me, is up despicable. until two weeks ago, when like, she opens her mouth and tells us that we can only speak English in this city. That's not what she said. Yes, exactly. That's not what she said. She said that perhaps, perhaps we should consider whether or not English should be the official language for the city of Lancaster. And you know, you pulled the same crap when she got when she put up the "and God we trust." You tried to make that as something despicable. It's not despicable. It doesn't. That you know, being God being trust, Americans, does not include all being people. Americans, and speaking English only in this council chamber does not include all the people. Thank you, Mr. Pelka. We appreciate your comments. Bet. You're right, I don't. I don't. I think that you turned this into a circus. No, you have. Mrs. Ebbett? Thank you for taking the time to let me speak. I have been in this valley for over 20 years. I've raised three children. I live on the east side. I've been part of your Antelope Valley War on Crime. Big advocate of it. Big advocate against crime in it, period. I say to you, I'm tired of waiting. The east side is in despair. I've listened to people talk about this free zone. Where is it at? My grandkids come over to my house. I can't even let them outside because of the gang violence that goes on in our neighborhoods. I have worked hard and I've stayed true to the Antelope Valley War on Crime. I've sat in to block councils, the meetings, asked the same questions. I seek, I commend y'all, you've done a great job on the west side, but you need to get over on the east side. Gunfire almost every single night. We call the sheriffs. Do you know where it's at? No, we live in a cul-de-sac, so it echoes. We get it from 27. I have a sheriff friend that calls me to tell me, by the way, there's a guy behind you that's with a gun in the yard. Don't come out of the house. This is the kind of conditions we're living under. 
We say to you, please, is there something that you guys can do? I know you're focused on the west side, and you've done a great job, and I've seen the flyers, I've seen the meetings, I've seen everything, but I'd like to see it in my neighborhood. Cherry, you live on the east side, you see it. I say to the city, you've done a great job with the graffiti. I call you guys every single morning, and praise God, you've been out there and taken care of our walls and kept the graffiti off there. But we need to do something about the violence. You can come by in my neighborhood and listen after 8 o'clock, and I guarantee you the whirly bird is up, and the lights are going on from 20th and K to 25th. We have a... I don't know what the heck it is over there. It's a multinational <laughs> complex where there's a lot of violence, a lot of gangbangers, a lot of child molesters. I say to you, please, when do we get ours on the east side? I was told the dividing sections are from 20th West to 20th East, from Avenue I to Avenue L. Well, I'm on 25th. Okay. You know, I want, I want to be clear on that. That, that is true. Yes. That, that is true that, mm -hmm. that six months ago mm -hmm. there, there was a, 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 a dividing line of where the core of the city was, and that's where they were going to attack the crime first. That is no longer true. Well, as that, three that months it was. I was told by Lancaster Court team. I sat in this, it, it, this place it, right it better, here. It better not be. And that's what they told me. They said, well, they gave me personal phone numbers. But let me, well, let, me, let me tell you what we're doing, all right? As, as soon as the technology is in play, but I know the Sheriff's Department has, has funded it, we will very soon be able to identify every gangbanger, every Section 8 house, every person on parole, and then we'll know within 24 hours where the, crime, where the crimes are happening, and then we'll, we'll be able to start targeting that. Now, one of the things the Crime Commission is going to do is we're going to start walking these neighborhoods. And we will make your neighborhood first, and we will start it at 8 o'clock at night, and we will hear for ourselves. Uh, and we will walk through it and just see what's going on. But ultimately, if we're going to take back the, the neighborhoods that are affected on, throughout this community, we're going to have to have the neighbors do it. Absolutely. And so, our neighborhood is devoted. Now, I would, I would really like when I come out there that you have some neighbors walk with me. Because hey, I'll be I really right there. Don't, All my neighbors <laughs> will be there because we are very active in our neighborhood. Okay. We finally Good. have gotten our neighborhood, our little cul-de-sac there on Serenity Court. And, and, and I will pull, the, I'll pull what statistics, crime statistics we have for that area and see what's happening. But. We've had kids killed on the next street. We are not, we are not targeting a, a central area of the city. I, I think that is, is something we... Well, I see in the newspaper, you know, in the Yellow Valley Press, you know, how great job everybody's doing on the west side. And I do commend it. It's wonderful. And, and I'm all for it. But it's not the west side. It's the city. I you understand that. I mean, you realize that... The, I understand that. I agree with that. I read letters to the Yellow Valley Press, and they haven't even put it in. So, obviously, they don't care what I have to say. But I'm here before you, we all... You must have said something nice about us. <laughs> I do say nice things about you guys. But not about them. But thank you very much. But I, I will look at the numbers there and, and see what's going on, and I'll I talk to the so. captain. And the captain is here, so... Yeah, Mayor, I might suggest if you could, uh, the captain's in the back, if you can give him specific information. We have the resources. What we need is exactly what the mayor said, the information. Information, if you give it to him. He can also talk to you about east side as well. That'd be wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Stan Foster. Mayor, uh, Vice Mayor and Council, uh, my name is Stan Foster. I got an issue. It's something about saving money for the city, actually, of Lancaster. But I live in Rancho Mirage on 20th Street East, and as a concerned citizen about our city water problems, I have over the past year and more and more have been in contact with the city's engineering department in an effort to stem the flow of this river of water from the intersection of East Avenue K along 20th Street East along the west side of the street, along 20th Street. It was thought the situation was corrected some months ago, but has seen an almost continuous flow of water, wasted water, going down the gutter in a northerly direction all the way to East Avenue H. 
what I have observed over a period of 12 to the past 12 to 14 months is an estimated plus what I figure millions of gallons of wasted water going down the gutter. This is 20th Street East. Yesterday, I decided to go the route and take pictures, which I have here to give to you. This is a low flow of what normally goes down the gutters. Today, I found nothing in the gutters until I saw water flowing at the, into the intersection at East Avenue J10 and 20th Street East. By curiosity, I found property being watered at 115, which is in, and I have an address here, I'm not going to throw it out, and water flowing at an empty house on another street, which was on Einstein. There, a continuous flow of water was coming out of a pipe that was uh, coming into the gutter from in the back someplace. Uh, the particular house was vacant, the front of it and the back of it, the, I could observe the, the lawn was dead. But anyway, that water flowed at the end of that cul-de-sac at Einstein onto David and was going on down and ultimately got to J10 and 20th and continued north towards Walmart and East Avenue I. Now there's another area that between Lancaster Boulevard and up to Avenue H, which is dirt, um, okay, real quick like, <laughs> but it's stagnant water along the either sides of the road there. And this concerns me particularly about the mosquito problem and so on and so forth, but most importantly, why the waste of drinking water? And I have here, I can give it to you for your records here, but when I went in the past, July, numerous days, one after the other, the water was just continuously flowing on a Tuesday, a Thursday, a Saturday, a Tuesday, and so on and so forth. That's the thing, and I, I cannot understand where that water is going. I've tried through the engineer department to have something done, and they have come out and they've cooperated. They've done real well, and I'll give it to you if you want that pictures. Uh, and they've done wonderful trying to go out there trying to out at the original, at the origin of the water, 20th Street East and uh, Avenue K. It's still coming out of the pipes. In fact, when I came here this evening, from what I was okay, talking I'm about, sorry, the I'm, water was I'm, coming I'm breaking, out. I'm breaking the rules. we got a three-minute rule and I'm okay. breaking the rules. I'm sorry. Although, I, I do want to point out that I, on the walk today, that that same intersection was brought up. There, there seems to be an ongoing problem we need to get addressed. Okay. And, we will. And let's put some energy on it, okay? We will. Okay. Stan Foster? Oh, that was you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Gerald. Big lap. Oh, okay. Good evening. Good evening. I'm Joe Bielk. I live at 6523 Embargo Court, Palmdale, California, 93551. You ask why I'm here? I want to talk about English only, but I don't want to bring up the subject or not. But anyway, then I want to talk about Verizon. It is kind of a hot issue, isn't it? <laughs> well, English, one, English only. My ancestors experienced that at, during World War I. They come to this country as immigrants from Germany, and they taught their children German. And they went to school to learn English. That's the way it was. During World War I, they accused of not being loyal Americans, so they dropped the language like, bang. That was it. So I don't know whether I learned the German language or not. But I have nothing wrong with a two-language family. The problem I have with English, if you're in this country, English is the language of this country. And if you pass the citizenship deal, you have to know the English language. But we print 23 ballots or 27 ballots in foreign languages. Talk about a waste of money. So 
That's, that's my point about it. Now, I moved to California in 1935. What do you suppose we had in Chino? Separated schools. The D Street schools were for Mexican kids to go to learn English. And they went and learned English. And Ruben Yala, one of my classmates, became the senator from Chino because he got started in that Mexican school to learn English. Now, Verizon. Now, in 1955, I had better telephone service in Lancaster than I have in Verizon now. <laughs> we had to call Central to get out. Central answered, and we got out. <laughs> now, I challenged some people to call Verizon today. My wife sat on the phone for one hour and never got an answer. Now, what Verizon did to me and my wife, we purchased a phone, put an answer machine on Put the message there. Oh, once we weren't getting messages. Well, something mattered with the phone, so we thought about it, thought about it. Well, may I go on? Okay. And so, lo and behold, we called Verizon. Well, you have voicemail. Well, how come I have voicemail? Well, you're paying for it. Well, how am I paying for it? I never signed up for it. So I had to call, get code get my voicemail from Verizon. It costs ten dollars a month. So I know you you don't have any authority o over franchise in Verizon, but we ought use, to. and you represent the citizens of Lancaster, so it's your lap. Any questions? Do we have Verizon in Lancaster? Yes we do. <laughs> Let's make a call. I, I think that's uh, if they're if they're ripping it, ripping our citizens off by giving them voicemail without asking them. I got the that. lady out the lobby before you open. She says, "I put my message on now. Message we'll down look, there. We'll look into it. Okay. Okay. Thank you. There's another example of, of, of local is frequently better. That central office is right across the street. Okay, Holly Pelka. I was guessing I wasn't here till wasn't even born till 1962. <laughs> you walk out, okay. Paul. David Paul. Yeah. Mr. Mayor and Council members, it's always fun to come to Council. I really enjoyed tonight. Oh, gee, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> As I was standing there thinking, and, and first, Mr. Mayor, Margaret Thatcher, one of my personal heroes, and if you get a chance to tell this to her, let her know that I have been criticized more than once in my life for saying that she was a very sexy lady. <laughs> I don't think I'm going to bring that up, okay. <laughs> This also plays into what I was thinking back there. Uh, about a month ago on the news, I saw our local reporter, Mark Archuleta, and maybe you could take him with you to England. Uh, he interviewed Sir Richard Branson, so uh, I was hoping he would ask his new friend for the money to support the violence-free zone, uh, and Margaret Thatcher asking him could help. It's just a crazy idea. I, I, like I said, I, I love coming here, and I understand what, what is being said about kids having someone to talk to. Uh, that's sometimes all the difference in the world, but what I always get back to is what you were mentioning, uh, why isn't that available in the school now through the school? One of my favorite movies of all times is To Serve With Love, and that's just a great story of how one person can inspire youth, but, uh, you know, there needs to be the follow-up, and uh, why we're in that hole in the first place is always the question. Um, I just wanted to say that uh, tonight um, I want to talk a little bit about one of my other heroes. I, I was looking into him this week. Uh, Mount Rushmore has four great presidents, and Teddy Roosevelt, you wonder why is he up there? But he was kind of a uh, that's, that's unique Theodore. guy. And in my past, I've liked the men who uh, come up from adversity. He was another guy who couldn't see very well when he was young, and that uh, impacted him. And uh, he was a really tough guy. And when he ran for uh, election again in 1912, after he'd already been president twice, he was in Milwaukee, and he was shot point blank by an assassin. And uh, he had this big speech in his pocket in his metal glasses case, and the bullet went into him. And I don't know if he realized it at the time, but he insisted on finishing his speech after he'd been shot. 
So that, that's the kind of guy I like. Um, True politician. I've had a lot of fun, like I said, at city council. Um, there's been times when I, I wasn't feeling well. I brought my kids here on their birthdays. I came on my anniversary. Um, but most recently, we had that incident where the power blew up. And uh, i got to tell you, I don't know if anybody in this room felt that when it blew up, but I was sitting there in my car coming to a stop at that light, and I found out recently that that explosion completely detached my retina and has maybe caused some hearing loss. And uh, I'm having that fixed on Thursday. So if there's any prayers here for me, I would appreciate that. But uh, again, a wonderful night, and I had some fun. Thank you. Oh, and by the way, my car is broke down. I need a ride home. I'll give you a ride, David. Now, you know, the truth is, is me and Mr. Pelka practice this before we come. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> okay, where are we at? We're into council reports. Council reports. Marcus. Um, first of all, let me say that... Uh, the Spanish issue. If anyone um, should call ever call me a racist, it's first of all they don't have a clue about me. I am in no way, shape, or form a racist, but I am a very proud American. And like Mr. Gerald, I couldn't get his last name. Yeah. 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 Um, you know, I after the last city council bringing up the um, English as the official language of Lancaster, I got hundreds of emails. And most of them were, thank you. I'm third generation Mexican. I'm whatever generation Italian, etc., etc., etc. It went on and on and on. Thank you. This is exactly how we feel. There were just a few people who wrote and called me a racist and used ugly words and um, you know I, I just looked at it and I said they have no argument they absolutely have no argument so then that's when people will go to calling names um, after having uh, thought much about this after having the research and discussions with the city attorney and the city manager um, I've come to want to tell two things and let you know because of all these people who did contact me and thanked me for it that um, I'm still very passionate about English being our official language I will do everything I can um, nationally to see that maybe one of those bills actually passes one day and that they will actually claim that English is the um, official language of the United States the other thing is, you know, I really don't care about polls. I don't care if I look good or if I don't look good. Um, but I do care about getting things done. And after some of the research, basically I was told, you know, maybe this is something that we don't continue to press with right now because we're pressing in so many other areas, taking over the Section 8, which is crucial. We're not thinking about it. We're doing it. It is going to get done. Um, the other thing was I knew that asking for an ordinance was not going to give us any law. I wasn't going to get any, put any teeth to it. But it was a statement. And it's the statement that Americans all over the country are adamant about. I'm not going to back off of that. That's a statement I've made. I will stand with it. But at this time... Um, I am going to back off. And um, the other thing was there's probably some that are going to put me in a category along with the plethora of gutless politicians that won't plethora, pleth plethora, that um, won't do as the citizens really truly want them to do. And that is not where I come from. But at this time, I have um, gotten counsel, and I will sideline this for now as we go forward.
Um, I will not do or support anything that makes it easier for illegal immigration, unlike the city of Los Angeles, that they just passed another ordinance. Um, and uh, I want people to know that um, those that have contacted me will probably be angry, angry and will, like I said, place me in that category of other gutless politicians that won't do what the citizens ask them to do. Um, but I will vent my anger towards the federal and state government. I will continue to work on making change. But for right now, I am reluctantly going to withdraw my request for an English ordinance at this time. Thank you. Sherry, Ms. Marcus. Yes, no one Mayor Paris. Ever call you gutless. No one. <laughs> yeah, well. I have a report, Mr. Said Sorry. enough on that. It's, it's not on here, but it's a report on the uh, Water Ad Hoc Committee. Yes. <clears throat> we did meet yesterday, and um, it's one of those meetings like our parole meeting that we've had where it's um, a number of the different agencies, and we go into a room, and we have frank talk, and I think we had, uh, we had some good conversations, and we're moving forward on a number of issues. We had uh, Supervisor Maven from uh, Kern County. We had... Uh, Representative uh, from uh, Mike Antonovich's office from Palmdale Water District, the City Council from the City of Palmdale was also there, and uh, so we had some. Uh, we're set up for another meeting, and uh, and we're making some good progress on the, some things, and so hope to come out with it soon. Thank you. Oh, any council comments? After all that, nobody wants to say anything. You know, we're, we're supposed to go into closed session now on the Bob LaSala contract, but for the past couple of weeks I've been thinking about this every single day. And at the end of the day, I think uh, former Mayor Arnie Rodeo is, is correct that this was wrong. He should never have been given that money. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, it was, it was steal. It, it was simply steal because it violated the law. But I think Arnie Rodeo was correct that if we put any energy on that, it's going to detract from the incredibly positive energy that is being and the things being accomplished in the city today. Uh, the, in, in investigating it, one of the things we discovered, or one of the things I discovered, is, and Mr. Wilson actually pointed this out to me several months ago, is that we go into these closed sessions and we do things and then we come out and have nothing to report and I think ultimately that's really why this happened you know my understanding is there was there was a vote to give him his notice of termination but because it was in closed session it was not reported and then people were able to stand out here in public or sit up here in public and vote a different way and convey a different message to the people and not have to be accountable for the way they voted and then the negotiation process takes place, and the next thing you know, he walks out of here with $400,000 he never should have gotten. Now, was that his fault? No, I don't think so. I think it was our fault in not having a process in place where we're accountable for every vote we take. And I think that if we take a vote in, in closed session, we should have an ordinance that we reported in an open session, and so that those, those things can't take place where a council member votes to give somebody a notice of termination and then comes out and votes to keep that same person he just voted to give a notice of termination to. And that's exactly what happened, make no mistake about it. It, it, uh, it was fraudulent. I don't think that was Mr. LaSalle's necessarily his problem, although I think he could have behaved much better. I think it's a, a problem with our council, and I would like that fixed. If there's some way we can have an ordinance that every vote this council takes gets reported to the public the night we make it, I think these types of things may not occur in the future. Now, if any of the council members want to go into closed session on the LaSala thing, I'm perfectly happy to do so, but I'm satisfied from what uh, Mayor Rodeo said. It was, it was compelling that it will cost us far more in lost energy and lost positive movement than we're ever going to recover. Any comments? 
I saw what happened at the Antelope Valley Health Care District when they chose to uh, reopen the uh, uh, separation agreement with their chief executive, and I think it did no help to that organization, and uh, I don't think it would do us any good to revisit that issue either. Okay. Thank you. So do I have to vote on no closed session or anything? No, you, don't, you just don't have to go into the closed session. Okay, great. Uh, our next regular meeting will be September 9th at 5 p.m., and we will continue the saga of Mr. Pelka and Mr. Paris's debate, uh, I'm sure. Uh, we also have a meeting on the... We will also conduct a special meeting with Supervisor Antonovich on September 3rd at 8 a.m. at the Greenhouse Cafe here in Lancaster. And that ought to be fun. You ought, all, you ought to come to that one. Not too many people come. We'll even buy you breakfast. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> you to give well, maybe the supervisor will buy us all breakfast. What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> and so now we're adjourned. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, there's actually an AG's opinion that says you can't do that. Oh, wait a minute. I can't buy you breakfast. Sorry. <laughs>